So let's get started. Welcome, welcome, welcome to everybody to Six Power Moves for the Maths GCSE. My name's Talitha and I work for Learning by Questions. I was a teacher for nine years, English. Um, so I do understand the pressure that this time of year can bring. And I'm really hoping that everybody who's on the webinar today can get some tips and reassurance to relieve some of that pressure over the coming weeks. I'm gonna hand over to Sue in a moment. Um, but first, just a little bit of housekeeping and also a little bit about learning by questions. So first of all, uh, Sue, could you? Great, thank you. <laughs> first of all, I want to make sure that this webinar is an opportunity to share good practice and not just from um, our guests here on the webinar today, but between yourselves as well. We've got a hell of a lot of math specialists here today and it'd be really good for you to share any tips or experiences that you've had over on the chat. and. You can also use the chat function to ask any questions you've got for our guests or for Sue. And hopefully at the end, if we've got a little bit of time, we'll be able to share those and we can we can chat about those. Second, we are recording um, the session. And so if you need to leave for any reason, you needn't worry, you will be sent a recording of the webinar in the next few days via email. So you just need to look out for that in your inbox. Thirdly, there is going to be an interactive section to show you learning by questions, but what even is learning by questions? So we describe it as a teaching app that harnesses the power of continuous formative assessment and immediate feedback in the classroom, which is a big idea. And what does that even mean? OK, so we're going to show you that's that's the best way for you to learn about learning by questions is to is to show you the actual platform. But just to just to head of that up. We're not in the game of replacing the teacher in the classroom. Learning by questions is not AI. It is designed to support the teacher and the students in the classroom. We also get lots of feedback that it engages reluctant mathematicians. But we also know that every other product in the world also says that. So we know talk is cheap and we want to we want to show you. So we're going to show it you from the point of view of a student. And then Sue will also share with you the teacher point of view from from her screen. Learning by Questions is owned by a charitable trust. And what that means is that the questions that you see today and thousands more are free to access and to be you that you can use front of class with your students. So if you have students and you can use the questions at the board and you can share those with the students and you can do that for, for free. But the beauty of Learning by Questions is absolutely the platform and that's what we're gonna be showing you today. To do that, it'd be really, really helpful if you had a separate mobile or tablet, or if you do have an extra tab that you could have open, that also would work. Okay, I think that's everything from me, Sue. Thank you very much. I'm gonna pass over to you. All right, thank you, Talitha. Um, okay, so very briefly, my name is Sue Hayes and I've been a maths teacher for 20 years. I currently work part time as a maths teacher and I work for Learning by Questions for the rest of it. So a big chunk of the questions that are on our platform and certainly the ones that you'll see today have been written by me. Um, in this webinar, we are going to focus on six practical tips that you can hopefully apply in the next few weeks as you get all your students ready for the uh, exams in uh, a few weeks time. Um, and I'm so pleased today to be joined by two specialist maths teachers and leaders. Jenna Sanderson and Nicola Whiston. Uh, Jenna, would you just like to say a few words about yourself? Hi, yeah, I'm Jenna. Um, I've been teaching this year for 10 years. Um, I work at a Microsoft Academy school, so all of our pupils have devices, which means we engaged with learning by questions quite early on when it started. And now I just could not be without it. So I'm excited to see what people think. Yeah, thanks, Jenna. And Nicola, do you want to just say a few words about yourself? Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Nicola Whiston. I'm a vice principal and a maths teacher at a secondary school in Stoke on Trent. Um, we're very different from Jenna. We don't have devices, but we've engaged in um, learning by questions via homework and some of the um, IIT resources we have in school. Thanks, Nicola. Well, thank you both anyway. Right, so we're going to. Um, very shortly get on to discussing our six power moves. I will briefly talk through them now. So first of all, tri to trig or not to trig, uh, this is about tactical curriculum coverage. Uh, a second point, we're gonna turn our back on the formula sheet, possibly, maybe, I don't know. Uh, question three, or how to make the most of practice papers. Point four, exam tips and techniques we'll be looking at. 
Um, we've then got revision. Um, obviously, preferably they will do some. And uh, also, should you play good cop or bad cop? But we're going to delve in a lot deeper into those. So uh, first practical tip to trig or not to trig. Now, curriculum coverage is always a, a very real problem. It always has been. There's an awful lot to cover in uh, just two years. Um, I think sometimes at this point, at, at this moment, we tend to think of COVID as something that's in a, the dim and distant past. But for current year 11, we have to remember that they were in year eight when the first lockdown hit and certainly had a very disrupted year nine as well. And this these two years are the foundation for your GCSE. Um, so how are we supposed to try and cover any gaps that there are there? I know at the moment I tutor two pupils who openly admit to completing very, very little work in the year eight and year nine lockdowns. What are we supposed to do with that as teachers? Um, and certainly in any year, forget about COVID, but in any year, by the time you get to the end of March, there's very little time left in the classroom to be covering uh, the curriculum. So decisions need to be made. Do we push for the trig coverage for our foundation pupils or do we stick to securing the angle facts knowledge, which they're more likely to get questions on anyway? So um, the question is, how do you find getting through the curriculum this year with your groups? Uh, I'll go to Jenna first. Um, the groups have been very different this year. I've got one group where they're not too bad. They've got through most of the curriculum. Um, we're using QLAs from their mocks to kind of fill some gaps now and really focus on their strengths. My other group I've recently picked up um, and they are a higher group. And I found that a lot more difficult getting through the content with them simply because I'm trying to get onto those more difficult problems. But the basics aren't as secure as I'm used to. And I think that is down to COVID. So we are having to kind of pick and choose a little bit which topics we really invest time in. And then some topics, for example, constructions, where we think we'll just teach it through papers and see how they get on. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And at, at this point in time, it, you do have to weigh it up. Is it, is it worth investing the time in going for something like constructions or not? Um, how are you finding things, Nicola? Um, I actually think I'm okay. I'm really lucky this year that I've had my groups for two years. So um, I've got a higher tier group that I would say, I actually think I'm pretty much done with them and we're, we're on papers and revision. Um, and they have learned everything, maybe not in as much depth as I wanted them to, but they are remembering things I had thought they'd forgotten quite well by repetition. So that's, that's going well with the exam practice. Um, my foundation group, though, I'm definitely having now to be tactical with my curriculum coverage. Um, although we may we, we might touch on all the subjects, but I, I know they don't have the retention knowledge now to do well fully across the board. So we are focusing now on the getting to the past grades, really. So what would you say, for, particularly for foundation, we just look at foundation. What are your key, um, the key ones that you want them to be covering that, that they absolutely must have, you know, at their fingertips? If, if I, in my class, the things I know I need them to have are your percentages and ratio understanding. Um, I'd, I'd like them to just understand how to use number as well, because that can lead them astray. I often find in my setting, if I can get a, a child with quite good common sense, they can get through quite a large chunk of um, marks in some of the bigger questions. So we're trying to focus, or I'm trying to focus with my group on just making sense of some of those earlier on in the paper that are too tricky mathematically but are quite tricky to pick apart how they get marks in. Yeah I agree and it is it's those basics that are, are really important sometimes isn't it? So in inclusion in conclusion there I guess the big players fractions percentage ratio like you said the multiplicative reasoning is huge and it comes into a lot of the common sense questions doesn't it? Um, so looking to embed strengths that they do have I guess you don't want um them going into an exam and actually messing up on those simple questions that you think you should have got it. Why, why didn't you do that? So taking time to embed strengths is actually really important. Um, and I think you both alluded to the fact that practice papers do become more important than the curriculum at some point, And it is a perfectly valid thing to teach the curriculum through a paper, uh, particularly because it gives them the context of the question they're going to get. They're going to get used to seeing the type of question that's going to come up. So a decision to not plough through the rest of the curriculum, whilst it can seem quite scary, is often the right decision to make. Um, you've just got to, to consider what you do want to embed first, I think. 
Um, okay, so moving on to our next one. This is turning your back on the formula sheets. Uh, and this relates to the fact that for last year and this year, uh, one of the concessions post COVID is that pupils have access to a formula sheet. Um, in my experience, this is a bit of a double edged sword, to be honest. Um, I think for those pupils who are fairly uh, secure in their curriculum knowledge, it's it's a nice little comfort blanket almost. It's a, a quick reminder. It can give them a bit of a nudge in the exam if they're feeling unsure and they can go ahead and apply what they need to apply. Um, but I think it can give a false sense of security to other pupils. And then they end up thinking, oh, formula sheet is fine. I don't need to practice this. It's, it'll be fine in the exam. Um, so the question here, really, I'll come to you first, Nicola, on this one, is what are your thoughts on form formula sheets? Um, I actually teach like the formula sheet doesn't exist if I'm perfectly honest um, it's there when my kids do their mocks and it's there um, it's actually not there if I just print off a paper and it's not in the front of it I often I haven't really found a situation where they really rely on it and I don't teach trig in the same way that it presents it in the formula sheet anyway um, so that uh, I think it actually came up once this week one kid has said miss will the um will the quadratic formula be on the formula sheet to which I said yes but the rest of my class have got that one remembered so I am a I don't use it it's not much of an aid to me and I think one of the points you raised there sometimes it can be more confusing the way they set out some of them if you if you've taught it a different way in class then it, it's counterintuitive anyway uh, what are your feelings Jenna completely the same I haven't mentioned it um until recently and to be honest I think my my thoughts on it are that if the pupils don't fully understand the formula where it's come from and have practiced trying to learn where it's come from in order to memorize it then they're not going to be as good at using those formulas so to me it's better for them to learn it off by heart even if that takes a while than for them to get used to using a formula sheet and um, so yeah i'm going to avoid mentioning it as much as possible um, oh. and try and train them to memorize those yeah, the context is everything. If they don't understand that, then they're less likely to be able to apply it anyway, um, I guess. Um, so, yeah, in conclusion, uh, I would say that if your pupils are relying on formula sheets to get them through the exam, then they're, they're not ready for the exam anyway. They need to have practiced it. They need to recognize which formula is needed and when to apply it. And that practice is key. Um, and just on this uh, no, at this point, I just want to mention that I have written some practice um, question sets that are just um, questions that you'd get relating to the formula sheet. So they are available on the platform if anyone wanted to take a look at those and, and have a bit of a practice with that. Um, OK, our next one. Uh, it's a bit of a big one, this, uh, making the most of practice papers. And I would say this is arguably the most important thing that you can be doing to prepare pupils at this point. Um, but the question I'm going to ask you, Nicola, first on this one, at what point would you like to use past papers regularly in class? So in my department, actually, we um, give from September, we do one paper every two weeks. We do only have our lessons. So I'm, I'm well aware that they're not getting the full hour and a half. But obviously, at the start of year 11, they normally for us can't complete a full paper anyway um we actually then name them so we have like a cinderella set a harry potter set where our higher tier are goodies um, no baddies and our foundation tier are goodies so the kids can't find um too easily which papers we're using so we do start every other week from september however um I'd say really get stuck in now. So I am it, like up to my eyeballs in papers that the kids do in class. They're not all ones I mark. I'm not at the point of them doing it and me marking it. But the lesson is we come in, we get paper out and the conversations around the questions in the paper are so valuable and the learning just starts to soak into them, I find, by doing it this way. It's just that familiar, familiarity they get as well. When you're saying they're having conversations about it and you, you get one of those typical problem solving questions, you know, don't even know where to start this and then one person will have a tiny chink of knowledge yeah. that and, and it's those discussions and I think it's really valuable for people or, or pupils to see that yeah you look at a question you don't automatically know straight away what to do um yeah definitely. okay you know digging around to get there is, is a yeah. good thing I will um, say as well I've got a wonderful group with them um, a load of boys in and what I find with the boys is they they they're up and out of their seat but trying to find somebody else to help them at the, that thinks the same way they think so it becomes such a nice environment to be sort yeah. of facilitating the learning not really directing the learning anymore in 
there's nothing better than hearing pupils having a conversation about maths and almost arguing yeah. their point about it, is there? It's brilliant, um, yeah. It's so good. Jenna, uh, what are your thoughts on the uh, exam papers? Yeah, I think the earlier that the pupils get used to the format of them, the better. Um, I quite often nowadays put up a question and start by saying, whereabouts would this be in the exam paper? How difficult do you think it is? How many marks do you think it is? And I think getting them used to that and the right mindset is so important. We've been trying to um, sort of drip feed them this year. And um, so we start off in September just doing first 15 Fridays. So just the first 15 marks of an exam, because especially for your foundation groups, that is so essential. If they're dropping a couple of marks during that part, it's almost not worth teaching them trig because it's only yeah. going to give them a few marks. And they're better doing that by constantly practicing the beginning of the paper that we know they are capable of. So we do really hammer that part and then sort of extend it to, can you get to the staples before you make a mistake? Can you really focus on getting the first half right? Um, I'd say with the higher groups, we do leave it a little bit longer. I think it can be a bit overfacing for them if they see them too early on before they've covered enough content. But yeah. still looking at the format of those questions, it's so useful. Yeah, I love that um, you're getting the first 15 because that's, the feeling they must have going into the exam thinking, I'm going to get those. Though. That's, yeah. you know, that's so empowering to think they're going to go into the exam. I've got this. I've got the first 15 sorted. And hopefully by that time that, you know, to the staples as well. Um, some really, really lovely ideas there. Um, and I think I think we're all in agreement how important it is to use past papers. And I know you mentioned, Nicola, that at the moment you're not going through that horrendous time when you're marking everything and then you're trying to do QLA afterwards and things like that. Yeah. There's no denying that using past papers can be um, a big impact on your time, particularly when you do get to the stage when you're marking class set papers and then trying to do question level analysis. Mm -hmm. It can be a bit of a nightmare. So at this point, I'm going to take a break from the chat a little bit. I'm going to get people on to the platform, if that's OK. Um, so the reason for this is that we've written some uh, practice papers for you to try. Um, so I have got a question set ready to go, which I will just show on screen there. So what you need to do here, if you can, please, is to open another tab or to get your phone uh, open and um, I'm going to use the URL on screen, which is www.lbq.org forward slash chat, or you can use the QR code. You simply put that code in and it should take you to two tasks. Now, I've put two papers on there today. So I've put a foundation and a higher paper on there and they're uh, designed to be uh, non-calc, these ones. So if you can get on, and I hate to say this to math teachers, but can you get some questions wrong, please? Because <laughs> um, I want you to see the feedback. That's that's the whole point. So if you can go on, start answering some questions, uh, put in some um, mistakes in there, and then you will see um, the response that the children will get in the class so you can get a feel for what the children see. I'm going to stop talking and let you do that for a little while, and then I'll chip back in in a moment or two.
Okay, um, I have paused you there, hopefully. Yes, I think, yes, that was just a pause there. Okay, so yes, um, I paused you, sorry about that. Um, when you do that in class and they're full flow on the maths, you do get a bit of a groan sometimes, which is so nice to hear because you're like, really? I've stopped you doing some maths and you're a bit obsessed about it. So yeah, it's a very nice sound to hear when that happens. Okay, so um, you've obviously just seen uh, from the pupil's perspective, what they get to see. So they get um, the questions. We've designed it to look like an exam paper and all of those, um, these papers that I've written, they are based on existing um, past papers. Okay, so that you'll probably recognize the style of questions as you're going through there anyway. Um, so what you are seeing now on my screen is the uh, teacher viewpoint. Okay, so this is live data. So as your pupils are um, completing questions in class, this is what the teacher sees. Um, and it is so empowering. So it's kind of, it gives you a tremendous insight into what they're thinking. Anything that's green is they got it right first time. Anything red, they've got it wrong and they've still got it wrong. And anything which is yellow, and I'm loving to see that there's lots of twos in these ones. Mind you, I'm talking to math teachers, so I know you just did one on purpose anyway. Um, but um, yeah, when it's a two in the box, it means that they got it wrong initially, they read the feedback and that enabled them to go on and get the question and uh, get the question right. And that's where the real power of uh, learning by question is, you know, it's there. Um, in that proactiveness and it just gets rid of misconceptions straight away. So when you're looking at this as a teacher, you can see it gives you a tremendous amount of insight. So your pupils have had that initial feedback, which means that for the majority, little misconceptions are dealt with. You don't need to worry about that as a teacher. And then when you see a really big misconception, so if this was a class that I was working with now, I think question six is a little bit of an issue here. So what I could do is I could click on question six, I could see what the question was, I could view the responses um, and things like that. And that would then tell me what I would need to do with the next lesson. Um, so I would potentially think, right, oh, it's a ratio question, whatever. And I would think that's gonna be my starter, the next lesson. It's not a ratio, it's a different question. Um, okay, so it's that type of thing you get from it. So it kind of does all your QLA for you. Um, so. There's plenty of more things that Learning by Questions does in the classroom, uh, but we just wanted to give you a glimpse of it. And particularly at this time when you are hard pressed for um, you know, time to mark and things, it might be something you want to use with your year 11, particularly those practice papers. So if you would like to trial LBQ uh, free for six weeks, we will give you a link at the end of the session. Um, and like I said, there's Do so much. Go on. Yeah. Sorry, could I That's just okay. interrupt because I've just had yeah. a couple of questions on the chat that mm. I just want to run by you because they're specifically yeah, yeah. about the practice papers. Yeah. Um, so we've had one that says, which AO do you use? Uh, it, they would literally, they were just based on uh, existing papers, but they were based on a mixture of Edexcel and um, AQA papers. And they are just, they're just all the way throughout. I literally was mimicking the questions. So it, Amazing, you've actually yeah. just answered the next question which was what <laughs> exam board are the questions from yeah. so thank you <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Um, and I think with AQA not doing because AQA aren't doing the multi-choice questions this year so the the papers that are remarkably similar now I know there's a bit of a style difference but they are very much similar more similar okay so yes we'll come to the trial later and I'm just going to try and share my screen again and get back to the chat I want to get back to the chat so here we go let me do that are you seeing the slides again I never know what we're saying. Yes, good. Okay, here we go. All right, so our next one. Uh, this is really closely linked to the past papers, to be honest. Uh, but our next one is looking at exam tips and techniques. And it, go, it does go hand in hand with the exposure to exam papers. And familiarity enables pupils to understand what their exam technique should be. And it should be personal to them. So you may get some pupils who are actually quite able on the foundation paper. Um, and they may, I don't know, want to start from the back of the paper. So when they go into the exam with a fresh brain, they want to start on the harder questions first. Um, obviously, that would be the undoing for some pupils. So it's really important that they get lots of practice so they can decide on their exam technique and where their focus should be. Um, so the question is, what's your top tip for exam technique? Uh, Nicola, what do you think? Um, so I would say I've maybe got two. I think one is um, we've discussed earlier that we really work on the front of the paper but we do that earlier I think yeah. at this point where I try to push um my classes are around we talk about how to get one mark later on in the paper so that everybody knows um a good example is often uh, quite a complicated bounds question later in a higher tier 
but whereas I'll encourage them just to write the upper and lower bound which is essentially a, a sort of foundation aspect of it isn't it um but something else that works quite well is I don't know if it's just me as a teacher but my classes are actually always bad at graphs and shapes they're the two things they hate um so often I think I use those questions as sort of goal-free questions so it's about they they have a go at writing everything they can on those thoughts and you know those thoughts on those questions and I actually show them that they've answered it if they just pour the thoughts into it so it's strategies to get through the questions that they, they maybe couldn't do yeah and pick up those marks that yeah they, they thought they may not get anything uh, Jenna what do you think um I'd say probably um going back to basics is the thing that I tell pupils to do I think at this stage you've got some who become a little bit complacent and maybe rush parts of it and end up making mistakes you've got others who feel panic um, and so they don't answer things that they are capable of and um, so we were talking about this um there's a program called are you smarter than a 10 year old yeah and I quite often like play the little theme tune to that um and say that sometimes actually going back to the way you would approach a question as a 10 year old can actually help you to do better at it and um, yeah. quite a lot of the time especially with our like top end foundation pupils they overthink things um, and once you go through the question they'll say well it seems easy when you do it and I'm like well go back to how you were when you were 10 and yeah. read your question again and think what can you do what can you write down what do you think you might need to do um, and it, it tends to calm them down and they get more marks so that's yeah. something I really try and hammer with them is just try and calm yourself down and go back to your basics. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And I think we, we were speaking the other week and, and just talking sometimes, you know, you've got those problem solving questions and it is, where do I even start this question? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if it's got a diagram, write some things on the diagram. If it's a, a typical geometry question, it's missing angles, well, write some of the angles in there and, and see what you can do. And sometimes doing that just unpicks it all out. I think it alludes to what you said as well. Uh, Nicola you know when you're just saying just just get some of the information down right right yeah. it's that open-endedness we don't know the question what could it be uh kind of thing um I know Jenna I was, I was thinking back to our conversation the other week you mentioned uh a, I think it was a higher level student who'd got, come unstuck on a question do you do you remember the tale I'm talking about do you want to just mention that because it really resonated yeah, yeah. um it was a really simple question um about the area of a patio but they'd left it blank because they thought patio was something they hadn't learned yet. <laughs> yeah, and it's, yeah. it is amazing, isn't it? And I think, Nicola, you had something similar to do with circles in a theatre. Yeah, I've just read about this one. I, I didn't really realise at the time how hard it was, but I've read the, about this one in kind of blogs and posts and on the maths emporium. But this was the circles and stalls, isn't it, in the theatre? Yeah. We, we probably all know the same question that I'm talking about, but it's the language um, as part of that. However, what I did realise that it exists on the Maths Emporium as well are exam questions where it's all gobbledygook. So they actually took out all the words that make sense and filled it with gobbledygook so that the kids can also learn to work around it, which um, I actually haven't used yet, but I might use that this year and see how it goes. Yeah, I think I think it's a nice skill for them to sort of understand that they don't necessarily need to look at a question and know what they're doing instantly. You know, it can take a little bit of a while. And just like you said, just, just put something down. Think like you're a 10 year old and have a go and, and see what you can do. Um, that's brilliant, ladies. Thank you for that. So um, we need to, a solid performance is the main thing, particularly on the first part of the paper. If they get that on both the higher and foundation, then it's, it's going to be a solid performance. Um, annotating diagrams, I love. I think it really helps with their understanding of the question and also grabs them a few extra marks, possibly. And the biggest thing is just, just have a go and find some maths that they can do. They can find some maths that they can do wherever it is on the, the paper, like you were saying about your upper bounds, uh, Nicola. You know, it's, it's a few marks at the back end of the paper that perhaps they thought they may not get. Uh, OK, moving on to point five. Uh, so revision. Um, do some, <laughs> preferably. Please, please let me do that. Um, as an adult, it seems quite alien to me that anyone would go into an exam, an important meeting, an interview, anything like that without preparing for it. And that may well be down to my nature and revising for an exam would be a given. I call it looking after my future self. If present Sue can do something that is going to benefit future Sue, why wouldn't she do it? 
um, and it's all about consequences for your, for your actions. And conscientious pupils get this. I think they understand that, that by doing something now, they're going to make themselves feel more relaxed in the exam and it will just all go better. But what do you do with those pupils who aren't conscientious or certainly don't want to appear to be? There'll be quite a few who uh, don't see the value or they just think it's cool to revise. Um, and for those, it's trying to impress upon them that it's still advisable to do, but it can become their sort of best kept, kept secrets kind of thing. Um, so it's a big ask this. How do you get your pupils to recognise the importance of revision? Jenna, what do you think on this one? This is one that we've been talking a lot about. Um, I'd say that recently at our school, it's become a bigger issue. I'd say there aren't as many of those conscientious pupils. You really have to drag it out of them. Um, a lot of them will admit that that is because for a large part of their education, they could get away with doing the bare minimum. Yeah. Um, and so it's something we're battling with. You kind of have to force it from year 11s, give them little incentives. Um, but we've been working on, with Key Stage 3 pupils, doing triple topic tests. Okay. Um, so they always get tested on three topics. Um, so they'll be tested on each topic three times. And we're really focusing on talking to them about revision, progress. We're not bothered about the scores. We're bothered about whether they're making progress from one test to the next. Yeah. And we're really talking about what impact revision has on that. And so we um, asked pupils, did some pupil voice, and we analysed their responses and we looked at how their revision techniques correlated to the progress that they were making. Right. And then we discussed that with the pupils and they could pick it out themselves. That's so valuable. Saying, yeah, there was pupils who were saying, well, he made a specific plan and he talks about what topics he was doing and how he was going to revise it. And he's made all that progress. Whereas those pupils that just put, I need to do more revision, well, they didn't make the progress. And so they can articulate now the importance of it. And so I'm hoping that as we go through, that's going to see an impact to year 11. Yeah, and you know, it, it possibly needs to be taught as explicitly as that. It's yeah. not just do some general revision. It's where where do I need to zone in? And yeah, that's 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 really brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Nicola, how are you your lot doing? Um, mine, I have a tale of two halves, really, of my school year. Um, my foundation group, I would say it's by absolute force. I use my behaviour system to the nth degree and set them homework, small homeworks twice a week that tries to force them into doing something um, yeah. with the behaviour system at, at school, supporting it really, um, which isn't great, but it, at least it's getting there and they're starting to do it. My other end, are they do revise, they get a bit panicky about it, but they're a very big, very competitive class. So we go by kind of rewards and, um, you know, the dominoes can go a long way with a group of year 11s who think oh, if they can get to a certain <laughs> number, they can get a dominoes in class and things like that so um it's it's very incentivized and praise driven the the revision but it's by them realizing that when they do revise they do better um however it's the lack of confidence i think in my lower ability students that don't they don't even start revising so with them it's forced and then the praise comes after yeah yeah no it makes sense it is it's really tricky and i think with covid and like you said Jenna, a lot of these pupils will have got away with not doing very much. Um, but once once you've got, got that link with them and it's, it's clicked in the head that there are consequences, it, it you know, it works really, really well. Um, I think one of the things we need to sort of make them aware of is how to revise maths as well. I know you were mentioned about where to revise, which bits of maths to revise, but I think a lot of pupils always used to ask me, well, how do we revise maths? Well, you just need to do it you know yeah. you need to do maths to revise it and that sometimes is quite alien to them as well um but yes yeah, certainly getting a lot of practice and just doing questions is definitely the way to go um so the last one should you play good cop or bad cop um it's a, it's a very strange one this really um we all need to hear a reassuring voice every now and then uh, but equally we sometimes need to respond we sometimes respond better to tough love or need a push in the right direction uh, and you know your classes and pupils are best um, and you need to use this knowledge to try and uh, get the message they, they need to hear. Um, Nicola, which one are you? Which cop? <laughs> um, I think I just alternate daily, basically. I don't think I've quite decided where I sit on this. Yeah. And it depends. It's, it, you are right. It's a very much kid by kid basis. Some kids I know are going to fail. But if I tell them that, 
they just need to hear like come on five more marks you can do it five marks of this yeah. question right um whereas actually some of my students that are doing a really good job I will be like that's not good enough you can do it better we're not happy till we get 70 and I've got one incredible kid who would pass this exam without me and I'm kind of like are we going to get 80 are you getting 80 yes, this paper people. so um yeah it's I'm just really mixed I'm definitely not good or bad with a whole class um it's very much now each kid that I teach to get a different version of me I mean, that's brilliant but it's, it's it's hard to do that though as well isn't it and it's just it's, it's that all-encompassing thing you're constantly thinking on your feet and what messages you should give yeah um, good cop or bad cop Jenna I'm exactly the same um I had to give some papers back last week and I really wanted to make a fuss of one pupil who'd managed to get over half marks for the first time in her life mm. whilst also telling someone else that 60 marks was nowhere near good enough for them and you just can't do that to a class. It's just yeah. too confusing. Um, so I've started just every other exam that I go through, I record the solutions and me explaining it um, and talk about common mistakes and things. And so I can set off different groups of pupils working through doing their corrections. And it just allows me that time to go around and give different messages to different pupils. So it's the only way I'm finding it possible because they do need that. Some of them really need good cop. They need that, you know, reassurance. Yeah, sure. and, yeah. um, and it would be really sad not to give that to them. And others really do need bad cop. Otherwise, they're not motivated enough to get there. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. It's, it's a really tricky one to, to sort of balance, I think. And as harsh as it sounds, some pupils really do need to know just how close they are to failing. Whereas others, you would never say that to them. <laughs> you know, they, they need to have that reassuring voice all the time. Um, and trying to individualise the message is tricky, but it is uh, is the best thing to do. And I love your, uh, Jenny, your recorded exam thing. That's really nice. And it buys you some time to go around and, and give the messages you need to give to certain people. Yeah, it does. And I find that pupils appreciate not having to sit through me talking and through questions that they've done perfectly. They can yeah. yeah. That they really need and they can watch it twice if they need to and yeah it's been really useful yeah absolutely now that sounds that sounds really good um well that's it we've kind of come to the end of it really um i just want to thank you jenna and nicholas so much for your input it's, it's lovely um to do this and it's lovely just to have a conversation with like-minded math teachers um and uh, sort of like half an hour away from all the marking and things like that um so thank you so much um talitha over to you yeah, so could you just go to our last slide? We do actually have some um, questions from the chat. And I just yeah. want to say how amazing the chat has been during this webinar. So many people have shared such amazing tips and experiences and just been so like forthcoming with their experiences. It's just it's so nice to see and exactly what I wanted out of this. So thank you so much. Um, but sorry, just to go to the questions. Um, so we're just yeah. going to roll back a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Alex says, uh, what do you think the best strategies would be for Easter revision? Obviously, Easter's just around the corner. Um, what what are you you guys doing for Easter revision? I mean, I let them just take one paper away with them. I think it's important that at Easter they do have a proper break because it's going to be intense when they come back. And I get that some of them will want to do some practice, but I think some pupils can take that to a bit of an unhealthy level and then they crash and burn next half term. Yeah, yeah. I think um, we set a couple of papers, but we actually do do some revision sessions in school. So when we um, or whoever's running them in school at that time, they just focus on one maybe topic that you're not going to cover after Easter again or it'll just come up in exams. Fab, thank you so much. And um, Victoria says, any tips for running those lessons of completing papers when you have a mix of higher and foundation? Which I think, Jenna, actually, you might have said something on the chat about that. Could you just share that um, yeah, in audio course. format? Um, <laughs> I had a group like that, and it was one of the most tricky groups that I had. Um, but I, what I did was I split my group and one week my foundation pupils would do questions on LBQ. Um, now at the time there wasn't the GCSE style papers, but there were some assessment style questions which um, sort of targeted those problem solving questions. So that was really useful for them to do while the others did a paper. 
Um, and it just meant that I could still see how they were doing and give them that feedback while they were doing it. So it felt beneficial without me feeling like I was juggling too much workload wise. And then I'd just switch those around the following weeks so that I was targeting a different group. Yeah, sounds good. And I think if you um, if you were to use LBQ, you could run the both at the same time as we've just done. Yeah. So you could do that. Mm. Fab, thank you so much. Um, and what it, it, there's been so much stuff on there. I, I I'll scroll scroll back through, but one that I definitely pulled out a tip that I just wanted to share was um about um any of the formulas and trying to remember formulas. So Tony said a colleague gave a tip where a formula fact or info they keep forgetting, take a photo of it and use as a screensaver for a couple of days. I think that's such a great idea. You know, use it as a screensaver for your phone. Fabulous. What, what a great idea. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to go back through and see if there's any others that we can share. I think we're willing to try anything, aren't we? To get yeah. Yeah. I, I set up an Instagram channel where I started infiltrating their Instagram stories. Get on. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, practice papers, open up discussions to understand what is required, where marks are awarded. Um, somebody else said they start mock papers after February half term. Um, ch -ch 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 top tip top exam tip do what you know first and take your time being meticulous if you don't finish you've left out the ones you couldn't do anyway there was another one that was about um getting through the paper and just answering sorry i haven't named names here because I, I just remember it G getting through the paper and then going back and your brain will just be a little bit more warmed up so that you can have a crack at the other questions that you might have missed your first go it, it really has been such a pleasure and I just want to thank Sue, Nicola and Jenna so much for their pearls of wisdom during the webinar today. It's it's just been absolutely brilliant. Even as, a, even as an English teacher, it's fascinating to listen to. So thank you so much. Um, and we hope everybody who's attended has got lots of helpful information or reassurance um, from the webinar. If you are interested in trialing learning by questions, you can sign up to GCSE Psychic, which is our current campaign that we're running at the moment. So we see all of you as heroes and we want to be your sidekick. OK, so we want to help you with the GCSE. Um, if you sign up for a trial of learning by questions next uh, for next week, it will be Sue who's on the webinar today. She'll be taking your one to one meeting. So in that meeting, she'll discuss with you any challenges that you've got and how learning by questions might help you with that. Um, and you can type out the link. So it's there www.lbq.org forward slash GCSE or it will hopefully be in the chat in the next uh, minute or so if my fabulous assistant could <laughs> sort me out with that. And um, Basically, just to, to end, I just want to wish absolutely everybody on this webinar the best of luck for the GCSE exams and all your students. And I really hope that you all absolutely smash it. So thank you so much.